Well, I want to welcome you once again to There's Always a Way podcast. And this is Jay Strack. And as many of you know that have been listening, uh, whether it's morning, evening, or afternoon, or whether you're traveling or on a treadmill or chilling. Uh, and if you're able to chill, congratulations. I know we all got, have had more time than we've ever had, but it's not been any easy to chill. So, uh, but whatever the format is, whether you're watching or listening, you know I attempt to share with you people that have motivated me, people that have changed the way I think or changed the way I look at things or empowered me. Uh, so friends sharing their friends. And this is a, a great opportunity for me to introduce you to someone who's going to add a lot of value to your life, professional life, your private life, your spiritual life, your marriage. I mean, this guy is a dude. And so I want to welcome you to Dr. Ed Newton. I knew him when he was just plain old Ed. And then I knew him when he was Ed Newton, one of the hottest communicators uh, to students on the planet. And then I knew him as all of a sudden, not just being a really good communicator, but anointed that things happened when he shared. Things happened when he opened the Bible. Things happened when he made a presentation. And, you know, that's quite, to me, that's the acid test. That's the applause of he heaven. When things happen beyond just, man, that was good, or we just write it down, but all of a sudden we look at what we do and how we do it differently. And then he became Dr. Ed Newton, and now he's Dr. Ed Newton, lead pastor of the Community Bible Church, San Antonio, Texas. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, it's a small struggling church, 27,000 members, many campuses. They're a multiple campus mission community of multi-generational, multi-cultural disciple makers. And I'm telling you, that's a mouthful, but that is what this amazing Community Bible Church in San Antonio is doing. So Ed, I want to talk to you, but most of all, I got to just welcome you. Thanks for being here on There's Always a Way. Dr. J, thank you for the privilege of being on this podcast. I want to say to all that are listening, to be able to sit underneath your leadership and your influence has been the game changer in my life. So thank you for the privilege, the honor, and this sacred opportunity, honestly, to hang out with you. So grateful to be on the podcast today. Man. Well, now you know, ladies and gentlemen, why I booked Ed Newton. And, uh, <laughs> so thank you for being with us, Ed. I mean, I'll yes, dine sir. on I'll dine on that for a while. Yes, sir. Ed, in all seriousness, you have a story, a testimony. Uh, you've heard me teach the success secrets of Shamgar about starting where you are, using what what you have, and doing what you can. But if any story illustrates that, it's you. Share a little bit about your upbringing and uh, what kind of, you know, we'll go through this through stages, but there's so much to your story that I think will be a blessing and an encouragement to everyone that's listening. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. My parents are both deaf. My mom is in heaven today, so she's healed in Jesus name. Hmm. But I grew up in a home where both my parents are deaf. So as the primary communicator to a hearing world. I didn't realize this, Dr. J, but at the age of 10, 11, 12, here I was mitigating and mediating conversations to an adult world on behalf of my parents. I wasn't a Christ follower. I didn't underst understand what that meant, but here I was seeking to be the mouthpiece for my parents in regards to going to the hardware store or even seeking to negotiate a conversation with the utility bill discrepancy that my dad is like literally pointing at the bill and I'm 10 or 11 years old going call this number and tell them that this is wrong and I look back on all those days and realize that God was forming and shaping and sculpting in me this ultimate desire that I would be a mouthpiece not just for my mom and dad but a mouthpiece for God the number one question I get everywhere I go when when they find out that this is my profession as a communicator is how did you learn how to talk and Dr. J as elementary as that question is, I don't even know. I, hear you. I, I just know that I grew up in a deaf world and God somehow, some way made a way for me. And, and I love the title of your podcast because when I think about there's always a way, 
I was about 10 or 11 years old. And Dr. J, because we're both from Orlando originally, I'm in Union Park, Florida, which is a suburb of Orlando. Mm. I'm right there on Highway 50, McDonald's, right there by Dean Road, Highway 50. And I'm interpreting for my parents. This is before McDonald's had pictures of a combo meal. It's just, the, I don't know if our audience would remember. It was just type and font, no pictures. And I'll never forget ordering from my parents and a African-American senior adult woman put her hand on my shoulder. And I'm about 10 or 11 years old. And she asked me this question. She said, do you do this everywhere you go? And I said, I do. And then she looked at me, Dr. Jan, I'll never forget this. I'm 45 at the airing of this podcast. She said this, and it's forever engraved on my heart. She said, young man, I want you to know something. She says, I'm a follower of Jesus. And one day God's going to greatly use you. Hmm. And those words, even five years before I would give my life to Jesus, just settled on my heart, knowing that I was made for so much more. Hmm. So growing up at a deaf home was at that time, very difficult, challenging. Was there moments of God? Why? Now looking back, I go, I am who I am today because I grew up with two deaf parents. So that's well, a, that's a major kind of introduction to my world. No question, no question. And by the way, I and I have to tell you this, or I'd be uh, 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 negligent watching you na navigate and uh, in the midst of opportunities that most in the ministry would dream of, and you having to stop everything and deal with some of the most basic, fundamental, rudimentary, you know, issues. And there you were, because you always, and then of course, when mom passed to be there for dad, when they've, they had each other, you know, and they'd been through all they'd been through. And now here he is. Uh, so anyway, I just admire the kind of son that you are. And I'm going to, Hearing you share that, I'm going to share something I've never shared publicly. But, you know, I grew up in a bunch of broken homes and all that nonsense, foster homes and all that. But I, when you've been the child of an alcoholic, alcoholics, and it's WrestleMania every other day, and there's people coming and going in your life that aren't even from this planet, you think, you know, <laughs> as a kid trying to, all the abuse, all the nonsense. But I've, because of some of the things I went through, uh, I found myself in the last couple of years sitting down with, in negotiations with uh, Iranians and Palestinians and North Koreans. And I mean, some of the most sticky wickets, as they say in England, and some of the hottest, but, but I've spent my whole life trying to bridge build, trying to help you know, and I did that just to survive, just to have a little peace. But you never know when you're going through those things, how God will use it and what it means. But I've Absolutely. admired you. Please know that in watching the tenderness, because, you know, it's easy to when you're doing a lot of things to go, seriously, I got to do, you know, and I'm, and I'm sure you, there's always some thoughts, you know, we all get weary and well doing no matter what it is. But even if it's traveling or church is exploding with great growth, whatever, we can all get tired in our spirit, but just watching you navigate that is uh, contagious. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. J. And dad is good. He's good. And yes, doing sir. Okay? He's doing well. He is doing well. Lives in Florida in an assisted living facility and uh, in enjoying three squared meals and happy hour at five o'clock. Five o'clock. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. Well, happy hour for me for a long time was the happy meal. No, but anyway, yes, so, well, Ed, not only, uh, now, so then you have this conversion and you're how old when you have your 15, profound, 15. 15. So did you get involved in a church? Was there a youth pastor in your life? What, what happened? Great question. So I, I give my life to Jesus at a Wednesday night Baptist prayer meeting. Did, didn't even know it's called Union Park Baptist Church. They had an interpreter for my parents. I show up. It's my 15th birthday. 
uh, almost got expelled out of Union Park Middle School right there in Orlando for various reasons. So I, I'm now stepping into high school, still searching, still struggling. My mom and dad look at me and tell me, hey, listen, we're not we're not even celebrating your birthday. I just need you to know we love you. We're glad you were born. But life has been hell. That's the words that you, you have created hell in our home. And they dragged me to church. The same dude that walked in that room was not the same dude that walked out. I met Jesus at a Wednesday night Baptist prayer meeting with 50 adults. I was the only teenager in the room. I didn't even know youth pastors existed. I didn't Mm. even know there was cool youth ministries. I had no idea there were conferences. I had no idea of any of those things. And I meet Jesus. And, but it's about a year, my sophomore year, until we, we go to another church. Once more, Dr. J, you got to understand with both your parents being deaf, not every church has a deaf ministry or an interpreter. No there was a church down the road. It doesn't exist anymore, but it was called Parkway Baptist Church down the road. I know, Dr. J, you remember that location. And uh, we walked in late on a Sunday morning. I'm a sophomore in high school. I gave my life to Jesus, but, but, but I didn't know what it meant to be discipled. We didn't go to church. I just knew that I wasn't going to hell and my sins were forgiven. That's all I knew. And we walk in and the music pastor at the time, his name was Craig Stamper. He had already, he's already passed away, leading the entire church in sign language of a song. And we walk in at that right moment. There's nobody deaf in the church. So God gives this Kairos moment, this epiphany that this is where my mom and dad want us to be. The first message I hear, Dr. J., is a message against premarital sex. And and I'm going, oh my gosh, my life, I'm living in sin and didn't realize this pursuit of godliness, this pursuit of holiness. Back in the day, and I know this is going to sound crazy to some listeners, but when you showed up at church and your your family filled out a card, any content information you gave that meant you were getting a visit on Tuesday at your house. I, I didn't even know what Tuesday night visitation was. So all of a sudden the door rings, lights are flashing because that's how my parents know the door doorbell has just rung. I open the door. His name's Joe Allison. He was the fir- first youth pastor I'd ever met in my life. He was a former drug addict, Daytona Beach lifeguard. God got a hold of his heart and he loved teenagers. Man, He stepped in my living room. Man, I get just emotional thinking about it and asked me if I knew Jesus. And I said, yeah, but that's all I really know. And he invited me into this youth ministry as a sophomore in high school. The first time I'd ever heard I was a leader, Dr. J, came from a youth worker at that church who happened to be my math teacher at University High School. And his name was Kevin Kugler. He had just graduated from University of Central Florida, first year teacher. And um, long story short, Dr. J, I could, I could just tell you hours of stories, but, I, but I'm a, a sophomore in high school. I meet Joe Allison. I meet Kevin Kugler. Kevin Kugler's my math teacher at University High School. Kevin Kugler one day looks at me and he says, Ed, listen, this is going to sound crazy, but I need you to meet me Friday evening afternoon at the football stadium because a bus is going to pull through here and you're going to leadership camp at St. Simon's Island for fellowship of Christian athletes. And I said, Mr. Kugler, he goes, listen, it's our, it's already, cause we didn't have the money for it. He says, I've already paid for it. It costs $300. He told me, he says, I've already paid for it out of my own pocket. And I go off to this leadership camp for a weekend and, and I go, Mr. Kugler, why am I doing this? Because he looked at me and he said, Ed, because you're going to be the president of our FCA. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So I come back from this deal. I'm a brand new believer. I don't recommend this for anybody in leadership to throw a new believer up in that. But Kevin Kugler walked with me through this. I got loved on by a youth pastor. First time I'd ever heard of, I was a leader, came from my math teacher. And long story short, I surrendered to a call to ministry as a high school senior. Hmm. And I couldn't, I couldn't pass the SAT to our students possibly listening from, from CSU. I couldn't even pass the SAT. I had to have a 700 to go to, to play basketball. I was a basketball player. Made a 540 on my SAT. Took it again. Got a 560. 
I was taking an SAT prep class. I was taking Latin to enhance my, voc my vocabulary, take the SAT, fail it. No school would touch me. My dad worked at UCF. UCF wouldn't even look at me. Valencia Community College, a, a, a premier school in Orlando, wouldn't, sure. even, wouldn't even look in my direction. It was 13th grade at that time, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't even go to the junior college. But my high school basketball coach, who was not a believer, month of April, I'm about to graduate. I'm going to go take the GI Bill. I'm going to go into the military because I wanted to get education. I would mm. be the first one in my family to graduate from college. My mom and dad never finished the seventh or eighth grade. So I'm going, I'm going to take the GI Bill, go into the Marines. And my high school basketball coach, who's not a believer, says, Ed, listen, I know God, quote unquote, is doing something in your life. And there's a Christian college down in Florida that needs a point guard. And I want you to go, I want you to go see him. I set up an appointment for you to meet the coach. Oh, my soul. And I go down there and they take me in, give me a chance. I'm basically on academic probation before I even get there. I got a 1.5 at I got a 1.5 at midterms. You got to have a 2.0 to play basketball. I have a 2.0 first semester. I fail English 099. You don't even get credit for that course. I fail it. Take it again. Long story short, graduate from college. I'm travel just to put a, a bow on this. I go off to grad school. I'm, I'm the dude that couldn't pass the SAT, but I got two master's degrees and a doctorate degree. So for somebody listening, when mm -hmm. a guidance counselor tells you you're not college material or you feel like there's no way, God makes a way when there, there is no way. He opens doors that no man can open. And for me, it was just following favor. I go off to grad school. I, I, I become an associate pastor at a church. Long story. I'm speaking at a student conference, Dr. J. And this young girl walks up to me and she said, she said, Mr. Ed, can I have 20 minutes with you? I said, absolutely. I said, why? She says, I signed up to come to this conference because of you. And I said, tell me, tell me why there, there's various speakers. There's various bands. Why did you come to this camp? And it's our, it's our good friend, Scott Dawson's camp down at, it was at Panama city. Of course. And she tells, she mentions her first name and then she says her last name. She says Kugler. And I go, by any chance, and, and before I could finish it, she's bawling. Mr. Kugler got married as soon as I went off to college. And he and his wife were about to have their first child. And Mr. Kugler died before the birth of his, of his child. His wife was nine months pregnant. He died of a brain tumor. He never got to see his, his daughter. So this is Kevin Kugler's daughter. Wow. That dad never got a chance to meet. Whose mom says, I want you to go to that camp because that guy's speaking. Hmm. Your dad hmm. that you never met impacted and she asked me this question to put it mildly, she goes, right? to put it mildly he impacted oh me. oh she looks at me and she goes would you just tell me 20 minutes of stories about my dad dr j i i, I say this not hmm. lightly hmm. i'm on a podcast today only because I stand on the shoulders of men like you and so many others that believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. So for the Kevin Kuglers out there, hmm. thank you. Yeah, you know, not a household name. Thank you. Didn't write a lot of books. You know, yes, didn't, didn't receive a lot of awards, but he's going to get one reward. He's going to get to see his daughter <laughs> yeah. again. Yeah. 
you know. He was nerdy, man. I mean, he had, oh. he, he, his, his khaki, his khakis were short. He's a math teacher. He's a math he, teacher. All, <laughs> no. he was so nerdy, but he was the coolest guy I'd ever met because there was a there was anointing. You said that. There was just anointing. So all, all that to say, Dr. J, yeah, that's that's my backstory. And I mm-hmm. say this often, and I probably ripped this off from Rip, the, rip this off from you. My life is like the turtle on a fence post, man. I don't know how I got here, but the view is unbelievable. Yeah, amen. Amen. Yeah, I first ran across that saying. I was writing a book called Everything Worth Knowing I Learned Growing Up in Florida. And uh, I'd heard that several times growing up in Florida. So I saw a turtle on a fence post and remembered the say, you know, <laughs> but it's uh, it's been around a while. But it, the fact that you're using it is exciting. And you know, Ed, in in all seriousness, uh, I say this for all the young people, our definition of what's cool certainly does change through the years. And what's nerdy, we we change all that because I used to make fun of the kids in the band. And now, man, these kids are running running the nation. I mean, they can play several instruments, they can read music, they're disciplined, you know what I mean? They have an appreciation for the, I mean, so all the thing, I thought we were cool. You know, here I was, you know, IQ below plant life, trying to determine who was cool and not cool, you know? So uh, it's interesting. The older we get, the more our definitions and perceptions change. So yes, Ed, sir. student ministry means a lot to you. I've, I'm trying to make a point and I'm making it with someone who will be able to take that and score a touchdown with it. But I've been trying to communicate to those studying to be youth pastors, those that are youth pastors, those lay people that are volunteering and pouring into teenagers, those people that run our uh, boys and girls clubs and FCA chapters and clubs, those coaches, those teachers, uh, those sponsors. But uh, I believe if you can do youth ministry well, if you can do youth education well, you can do anything on the planet. I believe that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Matter of fact, there was a statement that you told me a long time ago, Dr. J. You said, if, if you can do a school assembly as a communicator, you can do anything. <laughs> Man, folks don't have any idea what that's like, is it? They don't know until they've been in that seat. And especially when you get that great microphone provided by the high school that they use for junior varsity basketball games, where you hear every three words, you know, (laughs) of course, they're just glad to be out of class. So at least you got that going for them. But uh, absolutely. But I I firmly agree with what you're saying. And I'll tell you this from a from a hiring standpoint at our church. I've said this to to our recruitment process of of hiring personnel, specifically pastors if that individual has been a youth pastor, I believe they could do anything. Hmm. And so that's what we've done. Hmm. If you're to look at some major key positions in our, in our, our church org chart, most of these guys and ladies along the way would have student ministry background. There's something about student ministry that teaches you life skills. Man. Well, man, that's, thank you for making that point. I have, uh, been making that statement for uh, for as long as I can remember. And then there's another criteria I used to use. Uh, I don't want to hire anybody unless they've played a contact sport, you know, <laughs> because ministry is full contact. It is. I need somebody who's had to run the bleachers. Yes, I need sir. some folks that have been knocked down. I, I even need a couple of folks that have been knocked out. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I tell everybody, you know, look, I'm not, when you were my size, no one handed me the football. Nobody wanted me to do a dance in the end zone. Nobody wanted me to throw the ball or catch the ball. My job was make a hole or fill a hole. So anyway, for a long time, I thought that was the criteria of who I needed to hire. Somebody that had some music background, somebody that's, uh, uh, so they know how to think abstractly and learn, learn new things, hard things. Second of all, they've been involved with youth ministry because they care and they get it. And if you can do that, like we said, you can do anything. And number three, they've been knocked down a few times and they know you get back up. So uh, 
that's uh, very interesting. Now, by the way, you've gone on in the midst of everything else, Dr. Newton, have written, co-authored co a book, a very scholarly book on youth ministry by the book with a young man that I've been privileged to know for a long time. He's uh, Dr. Heath Thomas, one of the most impressive scholars in the nation, president of OBU right now. I'll say that quickly and pass right over that. But uh, former professor at Gloucestershire and Oxford, I mean, Southeastern Seminary, I mean, just an amazing uh, educator. And then to get, I love the vision of getting one of the leading youth communicators in the nation, somebody who spent their life, plus you're still 17. I mean, you know, everybody describes <laughs> us as an 18 year old that uh, quit dyeing his hair. Of course, you yes, know, sir. Trying, yes, trying to sir. keep up with the generations. I've had more hair colors than a mood ring, but uh, anyway. <laughs> So when I looked up, my my hair was the same color as President Trump's. That's when I said, I'm going to go gray, you know. But anyway, that's a whole, whole other story. But uh, uh, I want I want to talk about student ministry by the book. How did that come about? And tell me your objective in that book. Absolutely. Well, the book specifically with Dr. Scott Pace, who is a professor at Southeastern University. Right. So th this while he was a professor, what Dr. Pace was at Oklahoma Baptist University, and Heath Thomas is obviously the president at OBU. Very much your heart, Dr. J, is making sure that that people have tools in the toolbox. You know, you don't mow five acres with a push mower. You can, but you try to get the best tools possible. So for for OBU, Oklahoma Baptist University, to take that that direction under the leadership of Dr. Pace, we co-authored this together. And it was primarily to serve as a resource for students there, but it's gotten so much shelf life from an academic standpoint that, that other universities are picking this up. But as much as I'd love to take the credit for this, Dr. Pace, who's a dear friend along the way, just said, Ed, I'd like for you to help me write this specifically in regards to how to develop strategical, practical student ministry governed and shaped by biblical principles, not fads and trends. So what, what outlives you? Hmm. And we understand that the word of God, grass withers and flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever. No and so doubt. a student ministry that's led by biblical principles is what Dr. Pace was aiming for. And so we just kind of, we mapped that out. And it, and it has been refreshing to step on college campuses to talk to other students who have gone through that, read that, and just felt as if that it gave them a biblical framework of how to do student ministry at a level where we're not just entertaining students and we're not just, in essence, lowering the bar, but instead raising the bar, helping students to understand this primary phrase. And I've said this a lot, and I know you have, Dr. J. We're not going to bore you with the Bible. Hmm. The Bible's living, it's active. And we want you to not only know the, the Bible, but we want you to know the God of the Bible. And when student ministry creates an appetite for a relationship with God, created by intimacy with God, spending time in the word of God, living a life empowered by God, then we really begin to understand why Jesus would take a group of basic teenagers and change the world. Man, Ed, I heard, uh, and you'll be interested in this, and it's not been well known or publicized, but a gentleman named Doug to Cole, C-O-E, Doug Cole, C -O -E, who started the President's Prayer Breakfast, uh, which is an annual event, started it with President Eisenhower in the 50s, trying to recover from World War II, uh, post-victory, you know, th thanks yes. to the United States and England and Canada and the Couple of an Australia, couple other countries defeated Nazism for the planet. I think we should always remember that and be grateful for those that brought that about, so we could have a chance at life, even though we both got off to a pretty hard start, rough start. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lord has a way of ironing out those wrinkles and giving us a life beyond description. But uh, I never will forget Doug Coe, who who's. And, and open doors for me around the world as we would go on certain projects, but he invested in key leaders. 
but he also invested in young people. So here he was rubbing shoulders with prime ministers and senators and Congress people and Pentagon people and the presidents and et cetera. But yet he spent a lot of time with teenagers and he shared with me, Jay, in my opinion, everything I've learned in resource, uh, research that the most rabbis would have gotten their disciples at a much younger age than Jesus did. So these guys were young men, but they were probably the culls. They were those that didn't make the cut. That's right. You know, I hear you talking about trying to get your SAT score up. Well, mm -hmm. I don't mind telling you, man, I, I blew that. I, I topped, you, you know, what it took. And if you added all four times I took it, that I, I, I did score higher than Perfect what score. they wanted. Perfect score. Well, I was turned down by 13 schools and you... <laughs> had a rough time, you know, yes, so sir. that's a good reminder. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. That's but right. the key is you got to start. And, uh, but Ed, I believe, you know, when I learned that concept that Jesus probably called those that other prominent rabbis had overlooked, it sure kind of made me feel that like maybe I did belong, you know, right. that even if I was one of those that had been called out, didn't quite make it. Uh, there was somebody that didn't give up on me. That's and right. when you've got those kind of teachers and those kind of youth pastors and men and women that care, uh, it's a pretty exciting thing. I love the title, Youth Ministry by the Book. I mean, that's, I mean that in essence says it all. Uh, I notice you start right away with a student's identity and you deal with the fact that in, in, in th this culture, and by the way, we're going through constant cultural changes, mm -hmm. but you've got to have an identity and what's that identity based on. So that that's the starting point of helping youth workers, youth ministers understand youth ministry is that number one, they got to be sure of their identity, but number two, they got to help young men and women begin to realize you can't let, you can't go along to get along. And you can't try to fit in to every single group that's out there. You've got to really find out who are you. That's a good word. Well, I'll say the greatest identity theft that's taking place in, in the world today is not with our credit cards and our social security numbers. Hmm. The greatest identity theft is from Satan himself, who, who somehow, some way causes a young person to feel as if they're not good enough or unfortunately dilutes their thinking to to aspire to be somebody else that's not themselves. And Danny Sinkfield, who's a father of the faith to me, who's in Memphis, Tennessee, said this to me earlier on. And I've said this to thousands of teenagers across the journey. Stop trying to prove yourself. Just be yourself. Wow. Stop trying to prove yourself and be yourself. And, and I believe for a young person to hear this message and not just a young person, there, there are a lot of adults that wrestle with their own identity. No it's not who you are. It's also whose you are. And when you understand that God has made you in his image and he doesn't make junk and he's wired you the way that you are for such a time as this. I love what Ray Stedman said, Dr. J. He wakes up every day and he says three things to himself. I'm made in the image of God. I'm filled with the power of God and I'm called according to the plan of God. And every day he woke up and said, and that's our identity. We're alive for a, a very strategic purpose. Somebody asked me what I felt when I really began to discover my identity in the Lord. I said, it was real simple. I leaned down and said to the devil, your mama. I mean, yeah. I, it's over, dude. Hit the road, Jack. Don't come around. You got no claim on me. It's over. Uh, turn out the lights. That's but right. uh, Ed, you also in the book and Scott and, and Heath Thomas, you know, but it's all of you together. But I know they were counting on you to... Uh, kind of mug, mug great principles with reality. To me, that's the best description of life. You get mugged by reality. Yeah. And one, we keep trying to avoid reality, but reality is our friend. I just went through four or five medical procedures. You know, a young guy as young as me, you're going, why in the world? But just to be safe, you know, but anyway, uh, but I did it for one reason. Reality is my friend. If I've got, if I can find out something now, the sooner I know about it, the more I can do about it. what. It, and that's not just true for a medical, but that's true for looking at your life. Reality is my friend. And I thought of this flash through my mind, Ed, so forgive me. 
I know this same thing happens to you uh, a lot when you hear something or you're reading something or you're in the middle of something. But I'm thinking we've got a lot of men and women who through no fault of their own has lost their job. Mm -hmm. And now they've been, uh, you know, told they're not essential or maybe because of some of the heavy handed restrictions or what all's going on. I think everybody means well by what they're doing, but there's a lot of policies that are just wiping people out. So there's a lot of adults, men and women, maybe even some listening to this podcast that need to understand what you talk about. You know, it's not what you do, right? right. You're not just a job, you're not just right. a title, but it's you. And if you believe in you and you're willing to, to call an audible, you're willing to do what it takes. I believe, I believe even the best is yet to come in these kind of difficult challenges. Yes, sir. Well, and I, I believe that the, the biggest principle in discovering who you are is this concept of God, God's called you. He's empowered you. Every single person on the planet has been called to be influential. We're either, we're either pulling people towards Jesus or, or pulling people away from Jesus. And I've heard you say this, Dr. J, our words, our actions really do matter, not just for today, but mm. for the future that we're seeking to build. And when we begin to understand that everything I do has to, has to walk in alignment with the, the destiny that God has called us to, then I'm not just whimsically going through the motions. I could, I could be a missionary in my marketplace. I could be a missionary on my sports team. I could wake up and just say, God, all of me belongs to all of you. And I could live for myself and yes, boost followers on social media platforms and have a following. But at the end of the day, hmm. and I love how Matt Papa said this, either God is using me to build his kingdom or I'm using God to build his kingdom. And I know this, if I'm using God to build my kingdom, there are sand castles that wash away in the sand. Hmm. But when we, but for me to say to our audience today, build your life on the rock. The storms will come. The wind will blow. Adversity will present itself, but you'll weather. You'll weather. Wow. That's a good word for all the storms we're in. What's the one piece of advice you'd give to those that are serious about youth ministry, about relating? I mean, I know that's a pregnant term. There's a lot it of is. ways to go with it, but, and I know it, it varies and, you know, we got, there's a hundred issues, but, and you've written about it, you know, a great mm -hmm. deal. So there's a lot of wisdom in the book, but just from your heart, what is it that you would say, how do I relate to these young people today? I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I've, I've not done those things. I'm not cool. I'm not hipper than thou, you know? Uh, no, that's you a great say question. say groovier than now, but you notice <laughs> I've, I'm getting modern. Hip no. Hip well, a, a synonym of relate is the word relevant. Hmm. And, and if we're not careful, we make relevance based upon style, not substance. I'll say that again. Style is trendy. Style is what's in and when you think about what's stylish, it's so interesting, Dr. J, just watching this raising right now, we got four teenagers in our house. <laughs> what they what they think is cool, what in my opinion was cool 20 years ago, which I've said this to so many moms and dads, just hang on to everything you got. Don't give it away because it'll come back around and it'll be cool. And I promise you. You mean those bell bottoms? That, those bell still bottoms. Hope? those mom jeans, those platform no. shoes, all, everything that you could ever think of. So what I would say to anybody listening, when we ask the question, how do I be relevant? Let's not lean in the category. Don't let that pendulum swing into style. We all should be cultural anthropologists. And that's a phrase that I use a lot. You got to study culture. I'm not saying don't do the homework. I'm not, listen, you got to know what's going on. And that's a little bit easier for some than others. I have to work at that. But I also have a living, breathing test case in my house. Yeah, yeah. Sure but when do. my kid, but when my kids move on, where am I going to get that intel? So before I had teenagers, and I'm traveling, speaking to, to students, and I'm raising babies. I, I was I was scouring websites to 
from People Magazine to Vogue, or just scouring trending topics just to really put a thumb on the pulse of what's happening. Hmm. But I didn't have to know everything, but I just needed to know enough to be able to engage in a conversation where somebody would listen and go, I know that guy's a preacher and he's going to open the Bible, but man, that guy feels like he, he cares enough to know about what's going on in my world. And that's the principle. It's the old adage, but I'm telling you, it's it, that adage keeps on giving. It's not how much, you know, it's how much they know you care. And that principle relevance from style to substance. For example, Jesus was not the most trendiest person that walked across the planet. That's for sure. But what he, what made him relevant is he saw the marginalized. What made him relevant is that he, he spoke to the needs of the day. He spoke to injustice. He spoke to all of the, the pharisaical mindsets. What made him relevant was he was dealing with real life issues in a way that demonstrated care, concern, and compassion. Relevance is care, concern, compassion. Relevance is not clothing, style, Spotify, playlists. Those come and go. So if I want to be a worship leader, I can I shave and not have the four-day look? I mean, you know what I mean. So you, you can wear pleated pants and man, still be cool. Tell me, man, next time we talk, I'm wearing a, a tie-dye acid dye dyed shirt i just want you to know all right all right i'll hold you to it with the deep purple logo uh <laughs> that's an old memphis reference by the yes, way sir. For, yes, sir. for some of you in closing ed there's so much to talk about with you and I, i'm so grateful uh i really do love the book student ministry by the book um i'll you know how you break it down for people where they are and i love the way you just put the cherry on the cake by saying uh, you know, you don't just have to have the quarterback or the, right. the, the most popular cheerleader to build your youth ministry around. In fact, the odds are great. Uh, mm -hmm. Man, just care about kids, love right. kids and uh, young people attract young people and love when you love unconditionally and you're willing to just care about them and say, man, I just want to, how can, how can I help? And just to have, I, I tell everybody, I'm Ross Perot. I'm all ears. I want right. to, I want to know how you're doing. And so it's amazing. You know, everybody says, well, how long it, you're, are you going to keep speaking to young people? I said, listen, I don't want to be the old, the old dude. Everybody's going, why is that old dude there? So I'm going to talk to young people as long as they will listen. And by that I've learned it's really, again, am I approachable? Am I accessible? Do I listen? Do I care? And uh, you've illustrated that perfectly. Now, Ed, the next time we talk, we're going to vote the whole subject to what I believe, and we have to do it because I think we need it today more than ever. But your book, your newest book, tell us about it quickly and how they can get a copy. But when you talk about the need for us to breathe again, get a take a yeah. breath, and we've had the breath knocked out of us, mm -hmm. and everything in our planet has been shaken. And so what, a, to me, the timing of this new book is, uh, I mean, man, we just got to get the word out, but, uh, tell our, and then we're going to do a whole podcast, but tell us how to get the book and about the book. Breathe again was a book that was uh, written several years ago, actually, while I was serving with you, Dr. J, it was one of our live tour curriculums looked at the several plot movements of God breathing, God breathes in the, in the garden, breathes into Adam. We see the Valley of Dry Bones where, where God breathes on the Valley of Dry Bones. We watch Jesus on the cross. The Bible is very, very clear to say that he breathed his last. We watch Jesus come back from the dead as the undefeated, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world and then breathes on the disciples, the power of the Holy Spirit. We see that God breathes on the Bible and the significance of that, all scripture is given by the breath of God. And then we look at that last plot movement and we look at the fact that we know how the Bible ends. We win, by the way, for anybody that wonders what's the outcome, we win. But the Bible says in that 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, that Jesus breathes on the enemy. Hmm. So victory is secured by the breath of God. I had no idea, Dr. J, that two major 
pillars around this idea in 2020 would center around George Floyd and, and the unfortunate passing of him on that day would be sum summarized and surmised as I can't breathe. Right. And then COVID-19 taking breath. Tax the respiratory system. I mean, yeah. Ta tax the respiratory system. So yeah. in between these two massive statements, I can't breathe and I can't breathe. There's a God that wants us to breathe again, hmm. but that breath comes from him. So you well, can get this book at ednewton.com. Ednewton.com. Man. Yes, sir. You've come a long way from, uh, the streets of Orlando. Yes, sir. And by I the way, that. I know those neighborhoods quite well. And it's I a miracle. It's a miracle you're still with us. <laughs> uh, Ed, what an incredible journey. Uh, so much to talk to you about, about building a church. And again, yeah. I'm looking forward to doing some events together on how to raise up communicators, how to communicate. You're one of the best. I also know you've studied that a lot. And you can help folks, no matter whether they feel like they're a good, you don't have to be class clown. You don't have to be, you know, Mr. Mike on Saturday night kind of a deal. Uh, you can be anybody, but if you got a message and you care, so there's a way to learn how to not just be the preacher, but That's how right. to be that communicator. So, so much, man, you're wrapped up in you. So we're very, very, very grateful. I hope you know that proud of you. Uh, this is uh, Jay Strack. We've been with Dr. Ed Newton. Man, he's if I'd have remembered all the things he'd done, I would I would have wore a tie, uh, a bow tie <laughs> since it's Ed Newton. But uh, Ed, you're the man. I'm so proud of you, and and way to go. Thank you for being a part of this. Thank you, Dr. Jay. We love you. You too, buddy. Okay, show off. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Gracious. Thank man, you, Dr. You just, you just need to get your own show. Oh, man, I'll let guys like you do that. Hey, hey, listen, it's amazing how good I'm going to sound on this because of you. But, uh, yeah. man, yes, so much wisdom. Hey, man, your sweetheart good? She likes San Antonio, everybody? Oh, we love it. We love it. We love it. Our whole lives led us here. And just remember now that you're out there, Wise men still follow the star. <laughs> uh, you know what? It, I'm it's going to be. Saying. I know, but he, here's what. I, and I'm a Cowboys fan. I, I just need you to know that. Uh, but, but my it's not God, as easy as it used to be. <laughs> no, no. I, I, I tell you, it is one of the most disheartening realities uh, following the Cowboys because every year, this is our year. Yep. And every year, it's not our year. <laughs> yeah. well remember it worked for the wise men still true today follow the star baby that's it that's All it right, we man. love you love hey, you dr j anything i can ever do please you know that yes sir proud of you thank you doc see you now will you do me one favor yes sir remember me when you come in your kingdom that's all i ask <laughs>